so excited to be the last presenter on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> we vibe for this, um, but the good thing is that this is the last one, and so we are here to start your weekend, or your weekend will start after this. Okay. So thank you for staying around. Um, ABC is a special education law advocating better for your child. Feels good, right? Very okay. good. So Lori and I are sisters. Um, one of us is older than the other. But we've been practicing for a long time. We were trial litigation attorneys for many years. And we got into special education about 15 years ago um, because of Lori's. If you can't hear me, tell me. But that would be the first time someone can't hear me. Because of Lori's um, son when she got a call from the school that they wanted to evaluate him. That school district did what it was supposed to do, which is child find. It found that this child may have a disability for which he may need special education. Okay, they just suspected a disability. Between you and me, I, I knew that all the time, but as an aunt, you can't say that. Because when your four-year-old is throwing tantrums at kinder care or whatever, and you're being called to pick him up, probably something and he's um, a twin brother and he's their twins they were born 10 weeks early and I'm telling you the whole story um, and he was always just a little 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 behind his brother so anyway they evaluated him and he needed special education was found eligible under I don't even know what the eligibility was because until you're nine years old usually it's preschool developmental delay or developmental delay and he's 23 now, and he's very successful. Um, and this is after Lori had a neuropsychologist in town tell her that he will never be on his own, he will never drive, he will never live independently, and he's doing all that. So it is really important to have a good education because with a lot of early intervention and a lot of intervention during school, the children that you think may not be independent, may well be independent. Um, and I helped Lori because I was a teacher in New York City for 18 years before I became a lawyer. And I taught special education, mostly students with autism and severe emotional disabilities. So um, we left our practice of law, what we were doing, and now we are devoted to representing students and their families throughout the state of Arizona from pre-K through actually higher education. Um, a lot of discipline cases, and we also do a lot of gen ed, general education discipline cases, and we find invariably when the kids come, because we always have to meet your child, if your child is getting in trouble a lot at school, we want to meet them because even though I'm not a diagnostician, I've seen kids who are general education, but they're hearing voices in their head, um, they're not having eye contact with me, they're looking all over, and I'll get on the phone with the school attorney and I'll say, you need to evaluate this kid and not kick him out. Because a lot of times schools will exclude children who they think have disabilities. A lot of times charter schools do that. Um, and there have been a lot of studies on that. All right, I'm getting ahead of myself. You just, anytime you want to hide this. So, that's who we are. Oh, our attorney made us put that. So yeah, so this is not legal advice. Don't go somewhere and say, but these attorneys told us, I am not your attorney, okay? So you're just explaining the law to you. Okay, so the basic laws that we're gonna talk about today are the IDEA, which is the Individuals, Individuals with Disability Education Act, and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. When you talk about IDEA, you're talking about a child with an IEP. And those numbers there, those are basically the laws that the attorneys look at. Um, there's the United States Code, which is the Act of Congress, and then there's the uh, Code of Federal Regulations, and that's put out by the Department of Education of the United States, um, United States Department of Education. And then we also have the Arizona Administrative Code, has some rules, for instance, they fill in the gaps. So um, where the IDEA, the federal law, says that a school must have hold a, an IEP when a parent requests, well, when is that? 
Do you know how many days has school, so, so the state fills in with that. So we, we have that information, that, that timeline. If, if you request an IEP um, meeting and it's not your annual, how long does the school have to have that IEP meeting? Huh? 60 days? Now, it used to be 15 school days. It is now 45 school days. Why is that? Because there was some serial requesters. And so the um, state um, changed that rule. But, you know, generally schools are well advised not to wait the 45 school days because that's, that's about a semester. Um, so anyway, the state laws fill in those gaps. Section 504 is for students who don't have an IEP, but they may have a disability, but not require special education. So think of a child who has ADHD and just needs some accommodation, such as extra time to take a test or double time to finish their work. That's an accommodation. But if their ADHD is so severe that their executive functioning is really preventing them from being able to focus and work alongside their peers and, and do the grade level work, then they will require specialized education and then they will qualify for an IEP. But a lot of times we have parents who come in because the kid only has a 504 and they really want an IEP. We prefer an IEP because of this one. Yeah, because of, I'm getting ahead of myself. You are, I am going to get into that. But yeah, so a kid with an IEP, and I'm sorry if I say kid, but a child or a student with an IEP cannot be long-term suspended or expelled without school where a child on a 504 can be. So it's important for discipline reasons that a child has an IEP. So Section 504 is really, the, the long word is, or the term is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And that, that is to um, protect students with disabilities against discrimination, disability discrimination. And there's also a component of faith. It's a little different than what you hear about in the IDEA, and we'll talk about that. And then, um, ADA Title II um, is another the law, but I'm not going to focus too much on that because really for today's purposes you want to know the difference between IDEA and Section 504. If you have an IEP though, you automatically have a 504. And the reason that's kind of important is once your child finishes high school, the, the IEP will go away. But you can still have the 504 and you can use that for you know, college. Um, and work environment, but the IEP go, goes away, but you always have the 504. So just so you know, when we're talking also about um, parts of the country, sometimes we'll be talking about the, the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit includes all these states over here, and that's the, the Federal Court of Appeals. So it is, the Ninth Circuit is pretty child friendly. So if you have administrative law judges hearing cases in the New York administrative hearings in a due process case, not so child friendly. There's, but they're impartial, but they're impartial. They're being recorded. Okay. <laughs> Wait, go back. Um, and then you go to district court and you have good judges there, but if you get to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, um, there have been really good decisions in favor of students and individuals with disabilities coming out of that circuit, that ninth circuit. So this is a good place to live if you have a student with a disability or a child with a disability or if you have a disability yourself. Okay. So, and just basically you've got legal rights under the IEP, legal rights in a nutshell. You've got substantive rights. And what that means is the child getting the education to which he or she is entitled and to which he or she can make appropriate progress. Okay, so basically if your child is just not doing well in school and the IEP goals are the same year after year um, and they're not getting the services and supports, that's a substantive violation of faith. Um, if your child has autism, and there's no um, communication goals, no you know speech and language, no occupational therapy to address the sensory issues. That's a substantive denial of faith because the IEP on its face is not meeting the child's needs. Then we have procedural um, violations, and some are some are insignificant. 
such as you didn't get a meeting notice for an IEP. You're required to under law, but you show up for the IEP, you're happy with the IEP, everything's fine, no harm, no foul. But if you don't get the IEP meeting notice and the school has an IEP meeting without you, that's a significant procedural violation because um, that impeded your right to participate in decision making. So we always say, if you're going to an IEP meeting or um, a net meeting where you're discussing eligibility, multidisciplinary education team, you want to get that in advance so that you can be prepared to participate meaningfully in the decision making process regarding um, your child. So those are the rights that we talk about. So if someone's coming to our office and saying, you know, I want to sue the school. I can't really sue the school. It's not well, you can under due process, but it's not like a lawsuit in the security court. But we look at what the violation is. Is it a procedural violation? Is it a substantive violation? Um, so that's our analysis of things. The child doesn't like the teacher. They won't change the teacher. Substantive or procedural violation? Neither. Can't do anything about that. So some things that you just can't do anything about. So if you want us to take action against the school or call the school's attorney, um, there has to be some substantive or procedural violation. And sometimes we'll call if the teacher's not, you know, working out with the, the student. So see, these are the principles of the IDEA, and now we can start talking about the good stuff. All right. You want to do it? Oh, I'm allowed to talk. Okay, mm -hmm. so we have, um, Free appropriate public education, FAPE, as we all talk about it. Uh, we know what free is, we know what uh, public is, we know what education is, but what's appropriate? And that's usually when we get involved, is, is a child getting what's an appropriate education. Um, and so that's a common uh, issue that we have to deal with. Uh, parental participation, really, really important. We'll be talking about that and some of the case law on it. Um, you have a right to participate in everything that has to do with the child's education except location. Um, and that's kind of a sticky situation. I can do a whole hour on that one. But basically, the, if the location is not appropriate so that we go back to the fake, that's where we can get involved on behalf of the parents again and say, even though the school gets to pick the location, it's not an appropriate location. So parental participation is necessary. Prior written notice, you should always get a prior written notice. When do you get the prior written notice? After, <laughs> after you have a meeting usually. Um, so it's kind of a misnomer because it's prior, but the reason it's prior, it's prior to when the actual change is gonna be met. For example, you have a pro you have an IEP meeting and it's decided by the entire team that your child is going to go to a private day school instead of a public school. When can they start sending your child to the private day school? It would be just the next day. No, you're supposed to get a prior written notice. There's no time defined as to when you're supposed to get it, but it's supposed to be within a reasonable time that they send you the notice saying your child, you know, the team met and everything was considered and your child will be going to a private day school. That gives you time to challenge it if you don't agree, even after the fact. They cannot just send a bus the next day and say you were going. So, and that happens with anything. If you have new goals, they can't just start implementing them the next day. They have to give you a prior notice. Now they can give it to you right then and there because everything's electronic now, but sometimes they don't. If they don't give it to you, they need to send that prior notice. So that's something that we also sometimes have to, to get involved with because the parents did not receive it. Um, Least restrictive environment, LRE, that's, I kind of alluded to that a little bit before. There's placement and there's location. Placement is the continuum, and I know we have a slide that we'll get into that, but either a child's in the general education classroom the majority of the day, or they're in the general education classroom with push-in or pull-out services, and so that would be level B. Level A is general education most of the day. Then there's level B, then there's level C, which is a, a self-contained classroom, and level D, which is a private day school, level E, which is a residential treatment facility. That is placement. Parents are involved in that decision, absolutely. 
so you're probably thinking, but you just told us we're not involved in location. Placement, location, two different things. Placement is A, B, C, or D, and location is actually the brick and mortar. So if the whole team decides on what the placement should be, this, the district then gets to decide what the location is going to be, which classroom or which school, um, where the services are going to be provided. So um, another issue is PSN, procedural safeguards notice. That's that booklet that you get, and you probably throw it out, um, or you pay for your walls with it. But you should really read it. Not in maybe one sitting, you know, take it in chunks and read it, but there's a lot of good stuff in there, and we'll talk about some of the things that you can find in there, but often I'll be talking to a client and I'll say, you know, you had a right to an individual, uh, independent education evaluation. Well, really? It's in there. You are entitled to it, and it's in there. So it's really good to start, even before you pick up the phone to the attorney, you might find the answers in there. So they have to give that to you. They have to give it to you at least once a year. They have to give it to you if there's going to be a change in um, placement. Um, they should. They usually give it to you at every IEP meeting, or they're supposed to at least offer it to you. Child fines is another issue that we get involved in a lot. That's Hope mentioned it. This, the districts have a duty to look for children with issues. They found my my son. They don't always, um, and they're not supposed to just be responsible for the ones that are in school, although that would be the easiest ones. The ones that we often come up with are the kids that have been going to school and they're totally missed. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And lastly, yeah, just the miscellaneous is ESY, which is an extended school year. That is not summer school. You get ESY, extended school year, for only two reasons. One, if your child is regressing during breaks and not getting the information back again in, in a reasonable time. Well, a lot of kids regress over the summer. It happens. It's, but the time has to be looked at as to how long it takes them to recoup. So that's why children with an IEP should have data. So if you go to an IEP and, you, and they get to the part with ESY and they just say, your child's not eligible, you should ask for the data and say, I want to see the data. What does the data look like? It shows the day before a break what the, what your child did on some examples and what they did the day they got back from the break. And if the child is regressed, that's okay. That doesn't in and of itself entitle you to ESY. But then they have to keep checking that. And so did it take two days, three days, a week? That might, a week might be too long. Now your child would probably be entitled to ESY in the school year. The other time you might be able to get extended school year is if it is at a critical stage. Your child is just learning the alphabet. Just, they just got it. You don't want to lose that. You can't afford to do that so they you can get ESY. That's a harder one to prove. Um, IEE, as I mentioned, independent education evaluations. If after your child is evaluated by the school, they have the right to, to evaluate first. If you don't agree with it, if, if it doesn't accurately reflect what you think you're seeing with your child, you can say, I would like my own evaluation, and the school district has to pay for it. They can ask you why, but you do not have to answer them. You don't have to tell them. I usually tell my clients that they should say something like, it doesn't accurately reflect what I think I see with my child. I look at this report and I, I don't think it's correct. They then have two choices in the district. They either say, sure, go ahead, and by the way, here's our, you know, information on how to go about doing an IEE and we'll pay for it. And here's some names of, of providers that you know you can go to in case you don't know off your own. And some of them are fine. I'm not saying automatically those aren't good. Some of them are ones we would recommend. And that's the first choice. The second choice is they have to file a due process if they don't want to give you that IEE, if they're not willing to pay for it. They don't do that always. So sometimes we have clients call us. I ask for an IEE and they just didn't do anything. They didn't file due process, or they said no and they didn't file due process, and where am I? So that's when we sometimes have to get involved. Mm -hmm. um, and post-secondary transition, that's a big issue for us. Um, kids that are supposed to move on, and we'll talk about there's all students with, I, with under IDEA are supposed to be getting ready for either post-secondary 
school, college or trade school, um, or independent living, and uh, employment. Those three things. And a lot of times we find that kids are in 11th grade or 12th grade, they're about to graduate, and there's no plan in place. We're supposed to start that plan in the IEP prior to turning 16. The IEP that's going to be in place for the child 16. I tell parents to start it as soon as possible. As soon as possible, they should be looking to, to start that transition, certainly by the first year of high school. Um, Okay, so yeah, your participation is really important. So this was a case again out of our lovely Ninth Circuit, and I mean that seriously. Um, but this was an odd case because here the parents went to an IEP and those services provided vision services, I believe. Um, and there was a clerical error in the IEP. And so the school actually changed it, changed the IEP, increased the amount of time that this child would receive vision services, increased it. From and 240 minutes a month to 240 minutes a week. And the parents sued, okay? Because, and there were some other issues, basically because they were not involved in that change of the IEP. A school district cannot change an IEP without your involvement. They didn't issue a prior written notice, and the parents sued, and the Ninth Circuit said yes, you know what, school district, you are wrong. You have to include the parents in all changes that are being made. Now, I will tell you that Arizona is a non-consent state, so when you go to an IEP and they ask you to, you know, to agree, they want you to agree so that everyone goes away, you know, somebody are happy, you don't have to agree. And in a non-consent state, that means that the school can implement the IEP even if you disagree, and that's when you can exercise your due process rights, your procedural safeguards to file a, um, a due process, to file a due process, or file a state complaint. But that can be implemented without your agreement. If you've ever been in an IEP and everyone's disagreeing, say on the placement, and you go around the room, let's do, let's see what the consensus is. To me, it always looks like a vote. Okay, so that's why I tell parents always bring people with you. Um, but it is whatever the consensus is. If there's no consensus, then the uh, PEA rep district representative, the principal, or the headmaster of the charter school makes the final decision. Okay, so that is put in place. Um, in California, for instance, that is a consent state. School cannot put an IEP into place, cannot implement it unless and until it has parents' consent. But that said, you still get to participate in all decisions. Okay, so they cannot change an IEP without you. Um, and then there are times when schools tell you, hey, there's an IEP coming up, it's the annual, and we're gonna have a Thursday. Well, you can't, you have a doctor's appointment. You know, first of all, the school shouldn't be telling you just a couple of days before. And when you're coming up on the annual IEP, they have to give you some, they have to give you some time. Um, and they should be asking you if you're available on this date. And if you're not, give them three dates when you're available. Try to be reasonable. I know a lot of people were. Um, you really can't have a meeting on a Saturday. Um, you could have one at 7 in the morning. You've been to ones at 7 in the morning. But it's hard to have one at 8 o'clock at night. So, you know, be reasonable and give the school other options for that. The school cannot meet without you unless they have tried to get a hold of you and they've made multiple attempts and there's no no automatic number on what that is. But they can have uh, an annual IEP without you if they um, try it multiple times. They've emailed you with dates, they've sent you notices, they've called you and you're just refusing to go. So, yes? Um, you said earlier that Arizona is a non-consent state, so they can start the IEP if we haven't agreed to it. Yes. But don't parents need to sign for services to start? Is that only after That's the different. So okay. That is consent for services. Okay. So the first time your child enters special education, you have to consent to that. Okay. okay? If you don't like the services, and we've had that, you don't like the services, the only way to get rid of the services is by revoking consent. And then they all go away. So if everything you goes away. If you disagree with a certain aspect, you have to go through the process. Okay. Right, so, right. Everyone understand that? You have to consent to the initial um, 
a provision of having an IEP. And, and to get evaluated too. They can't evaluate your child. So, so here are your procedural safeguards. I already mentioned that booklet. And this is what's in your procedural safeguards. You have all these rights. Um, so the IEE, uh, prior written notice, parental consent, access to educational records. If you request records from education records, different than public records, you request your child's education records. How many days does school have to give it to you? 45 days. Okay, that's a long time. 45 calendar days. Not to be confused with 45 school days. Not to be confused with business days. So 45 calendar days. What if you have an upcoming IEP meeting? You are entitled to your child's education records before that IEP meeting. So that's the exception to the 45 day rule. If you want, if you're having an IEP meeting, a MET meeting with they're discussing eligibility, um, testing, anything to do with the provision of a free and appropriate public education, which is a, an IEP or a MET, basically, or a red meeting, which is, I'll get into that, um, you are entitled to the record before it. Don't say to the school, this is, you know, I know it's reasonable. You always want to be reasonable, especially if you go before a judge. You want to be the reasonable, you want to ask in good faith. Um, don't ask for the records two days in advance. You know there's an upcoming IEP meeting. It's in a week or 10 days. Say, school, can you please get me all the education records? Or if your child is in 12th grade, don't say, get me everything. Get me everything for the past two years, okay, if you don't have it. Or if there's something you're missing, just ask for that. But you're entitled to everything. Um, mediation, and there's a right to mediation. If you're not getting along with the school district, ask them if they'll have a mediation. You can contact the state, state they can contact the state, um, Arizona Department of Education, the Exceptional Student Services, um, to ask about mediation. Do that, perhaps before coming to an attorney or before going to an advocate. It doesn't cost anything, all right? You also have mediation if you file due process. That's one option to try to resolve, and that's called dispute resolution. And actually, when you're contacting the Arizona Department of Education, you're contacting the Arizona Department of Education, ADE, Exceptional Student Services, ESS, Dispute Resolution. And you'll be calling them and say, how do I go about getting mediation? I'm, I'm really not getting along with the school district. Um, I'm hitting a brick wall. You can also have a facilitated uh, IEP. That means the, that the state will send at their own charge, at their own cost, um, a, a mediator. I'm sorry. Yes, someone to facilitate the IEP. Some school districts have someone on, on staff and um, I only know actually of Scottsdale Unified that does, and the facilitated IEPs have been there, um, have been very good. Again, though, because you have an attorney, everyone's on their best behavior, but um, I like facilitated IEPs. They're usually the ones who, who mediate cases, they're trained in special education. Sometimes they'll be a retired um, school district special education director, and believe it or not, in their role now as a neutral, they are very, very neutral, okay? Um, stay put, stay put is if your school wants to change placement, wants to move your kid into a more restrictive setting from a general education to say a self-contained, and you don't want that, remember I said you have to consent, that it's an unconsent state? When it comes to placement, you can dispute that. All you have to say is, I invoke, stay put. Just write that down. I invoke, stay put. It also means that you have to file due process, but it gives a little breathing room, okay? Because then they may rethink everything um, because they don't want to be involved in a due process. So the child stays put until that issue is resolved. And Lori had a case where she won. Um, it had to do with a location change. Right? So with the location change, but, um, she won and the school wanted to change location, so it doesn't usually apply to location, but it did in that case, and she, and so she, then the school district um, appealed, and so the next day the parent gets notice, we're moving kid back to this other school, and she said, no, the kid stays, I don't care how many school appeals, the kid stays. So she lost the district court. So again, the parents get a notice, no, we're moving the kid back. Lori says, no, you can't do that, because we're appealing the district court. 
And so, in the end, we actually won in the Ninth Circuit, um, and we got all of our fees in the Ninth Circuit, the district court, and the kids stayed in the school. So they stayed in that placement until all of the appeals were exhausted. Oh, that was location, right. Um, unilateral placement in private school, if you ever want to put your child in a private school. Sometimes that you people say, had it, take my kid, I'm just going to put them in a private school. <coughs> It actually has to be a, uh, it, it has to be an uh, Arizona approved private day school, okay? And say, I'm, I'm, I'm finished with the school district. Give them notice that you may one day intend to seek reimbursement. You can give that notice in my e-meeting, but always follow it up with an email. Say, this just confirms that I gave you notice that you haven't provided my child with the faith, you haven't offered one going forward, I'm going to place my child at a private day school. You don't have to give the name of it because you don't want to be bound by that. And I intend to seek reimbursement. Or you can give them an email notice, separate from giving the notice at the meeting and confirming it. But that has to be 10 business days. Okay, so that means you could do it the last day of school and put your kid in in July. Okay? If you come to us and you say, I, I really, I'm so fed up with that school and I placed my child and now you know, I want to see if I can get money back from the school. Our first question is, did you give notice? Okay, if you didn't give notice, there's nothing we could do. But actually, we have a second question. Why didn't you give notice? So if you didn't give notice because you didn't have your procedural safeguards, that's an exception. If you didn't give notice because your child was um, a danger to himself or others and you had to put them in another school, that's an exception. So there are certain exceptions. Or if it's only been a few days and you didn't give the notice, then um, whatever relief you get could just be reduced by the number of days that the school didn't have notice. Always give that notice, even if you think we'll never go back. Okay? Um, interim, oh, I skipped, interim alternative education service uh, school or program. IEP or IAES, that's where they send your child if your child has some behavioral issues um, following a disciplinary manifestation determination review. And remember I said that if your child has an IEP and they're suspended or long-term suspended, they can't be without services, they're sent to an IAES, okay? Or if it's not a manifestation, but there were also other reasons they, they do. There are three reasons that they can send a child to an interim alternative education setting. One, if they brought a weapon to school, mm -hmm. or drugs to school, or seriously injured somebody. Seriously injured. Not just push the teacher down. Then they go, regardless of an MTR. Up to 45 days. Up to 45, yeah, 45 days. Um, unilateral placement, we talked about uh, also, if you file for due process, and due process is the term that I use, this constitutional due process. The one we're talking about due process is when you file a complaint or you're suing the school um, for a violation of the um, IDEA. Okay, the, um, then that's, that's what I call special education court. And if you file due process, the school district must disclose any evaluation that it has not yet disclosed to you. I've never that issue has never come up in any of our cases. So we file about ten to twenty due process cases a year. They usually settle um, because it's expensive on both sides, and um, we're not filing unless we think it's a case that is pretty significant. Um, but. Very often we'll also try to resolve it with the school district beforehand, but sometimes we just don't get the attention of the school district. Um, state level appeals, that's your right to appeal the decision of the administrative board judge. And civil actions, you can file a um, you know case in states in superior court, and your right to attorney's fees if you prevail in a due process case and then we try to recover attorney's fees as well during a in settling a due process case and the procedural safeguards notice has to be provided to you in understandable language okay or other mode if not written so if someone is vision visual 
vision impaired, um, then they have to have it in Braille or in, or maybe it's you know read to them um, in audio. Not in your native language. So I once had a parent, and they, well, they were Portuguese was the native language, um, and they said I wasn't, it wasn't given to me in my native language. Said, no, but you understood it, right? You're speaking to me without an interpreter, so. You know, pick and choose your battles. Um, you understood what was said to you, and so there is no violation. I've also had parents say to me, well, one parent say that I'm not nice to them. So don't expect that you're gonna hear an attorney be nice to you. It would very really tell you what the law is and to protect your child and tell you what your child is entitled to. It's actually nice. <laughs> Okay, so the purpose of the IDEA is to provide a free and appropriate public education so your child's in the least restrictive environment to prepare him for further education, employment, and independent living. And this is really, really, really important. So write this down, 34 CFR 300.1. I'll repeat it, 34 CFR 300.1. Put it in your IEP book. Because whenever the school says that your child is doing well academically, 34 CFR 300.1. Just Google. CFR. Uh, yeah, Code of Federal Regulations. But just really, CFR 300.1. If your child is not, is doing well academically, but is not making friends, if your child is not being prepared for further education, whether they're going to do experiments in college with their, um, with, with other people, with their peers, not being um, prepared for employment, you know, it means working in fry supermarket alongside others because they don't know how to socialize with others. Um, and they're not being prepared for independent living because how are they going to live with a roommate if they're not able to communicate and get along? So it, education is not only academics, okay? So don't let school say to you that your child is doing well, don't worry about it. Yeah. So, how much how much progress does your child need to make? So, years ago, we went by the standard that was enunciated in a case called Rowley. And that was back in 1982, and there was this little girl, Amy, who was in kindergarten, and she had uh, residual hearing. Um, she was hard of hearing, and. Um, she was given only for one or two weeks a sign language interpreter. So she goes to first grade. She's doing really well in first grade. She's at the top of her class. And she has an FM device to amplify the sounds. Um, and a parent said, no, 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 we want that sign language interpreter because she could do even better in school. So this case wound its way all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States, and the Supreme Court said, no, she's not entitled to a sign language interpreter. You don't have the law, the IDEA, doesn't require that you maximize a child's potential. It's only that you provide a basic floor of opportunity, you give that child the same access as other children. The problem was, and that was the standard for 30 years. 40 years. Um, so basically, it was that a child just has to make some progress. Well, I still do it in math. Some <laughs> progress, a little progress. All the, all the circuit courts around the country were different. How much progress is enough? Some, some said just a little pro you know, progress is enough. Others said a lot of progress is needed. So the, the problem also with, with Rowley was she was, she was a, a gifted child, so she was at the top of the class. You could, and that was the standard they were using for kids who were nonverbal, who um, had you know uh, severe cognitive di difficulties, that had severe behavioral difficulties, that were on the low end of the autism spectrum. So that really wasn't applicable to most of the kids who were in special education. Um, 
But basically what it said, if the child being educated in regular classrooms is here, that the IEP is reasonable to be reasonably calculated to enable her to achieve passing marks and advance from grade to grade. Again, that doesn't apply to most of the kids that we see. So, a year and a half ago, another case found its way all the way up to the Supreme Court, and this involved um, a child who had autism, had some significant behavioral issues, and the school was just repeating the same goals over and over. So the parents unilaterally placed them in a private school called, called Firefly Autism Academy. This is a case out of Colorado. Um, that's the Tenth Circuit, and um, they said we intend to seek reimbursement. And so they sued for reimbursement, and they lost before the administrative law judge, who said, "No, you know what? The school's doing fine providing a child with a fate. No, they didn't have to do any more." District court said, "You know," and the parents appealed it. And said, "District court said, no, the administrative law judge was wrong." District court said, "Nope, the administrative law judge was correct, and your child is getting a fate." Um, so they went to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. Tenth Circuit said, sorry, you know what? Everyone was right. Your kid was getting a, a free and appropriate public education. You lost. So, and this is what the standards were all over the country. Ninth Circuit was confused, and we had a confused standard. So, I know I once had a judge say, you know, no hope. It's all very informal in this your child, that your client is not entitled to a better education. If your parent, if the parents want him to have a better education, they should send him to private school just like they send any other kid. Okay. So that, we didn't have a real good system for that in Arizona. Um, so I lost one or two cases where I thought that the kid should have done better. Go oh, back. Oops. So, um, anyway, so every state was different. Some had higher standard, like I said before, lower standard. So the Supreme, so the um, entrance parents appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, you know, and they don't usually listen to a lot of these cases. They reject most of them. They said, you know what? The standard's been confused for the past. Did you figure it out? Is it 40 years? 35. Okay. 35 years. <laughs> math disability. So. Well, seriously. <laughs> so. Um, you know what, we'll hear this case, because we have to figure out what the standard is, because really, rally doesn't apply to most of the kids in special education. Okay, there you go. So, the question before the Supreme Court is, what is the level of educational benefit that school districts must confer on a child with disabilities to provide them with the faith that's guaranteed by the IDEA? In other words, how much progress do they have to make? A little, a lot? And so we're all waiting for the answer. You know, we speak to the school attorneys, all the, you know, because we're on the phone with them all the time on cases. You know, we're like, oh God, I hope we win. And they're like, oh my God, I hope we win, you know. So what happens is, and there are oral arguments um, a year ago, a year and a half, and then we get the decision a few months later. And so the Supreme Court held, they didn't say how high the standard was, all they said was to meet its substantive obligation. Remember I said at the beginning, the substantive and procedural, you know, how much is a child learning. Um, the school must offer an IEP reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. That's the answer. What does that mean? <laughs> so that has, started, engendered a lot more litigation. But I go back. <laughs> so I did have a case, though, um, where a child was with the same IEP goals every year. Every year. They changed one word out. So an anthology process based on Andrew. And so this is an Andrew case um, because this kid hasn't made any progress. And what school districts have to do now is they have to meet more often. They have to provide services and supports. They can't just let your kid fail, okay? And the goals have to be appropriate for the <coughs> child, have to be appropriately ambitious, okay? That is really important. So if you think your child can do more, your child can do more and should be given more ambitious goals, okay? So always go the next level. School doesn't have to maximize your child's potential, but make sure that uh, goals are appropriate. 
appropriately ambitious, appropriately ambitious, and say to the school, these are not ambitious goals. I had a, 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 I have a case and I told the parents, I said, sometimes we just give advice. And the kid has significant behaviors, but there are no academic goals in the IEP. I said, you have to say to the school, I want appropriately ambitious goals. My child's smart. The child has significant behaviors, but, you know, he's, cognitively, he's pretty good. So you want to get those, his, his um, subjects, his, I'm sorry, his academics improved. Remember, not maximized, but improved. So basically, the important thing is that um, Andrew said you have to have more than de minimis, more than just a little progress. Okay, so there were cases around the country that said that they can make a little progress. Went from reading 10 words a year to 12, uh, 12 words a year. That's de minimis. That just means it's really too small. So what does that mean? Basically, again, just tell the school, you know, we need to have a, I love this, we need to have a conversation. My child can, be, can do more than what you think he could do, what she can do, and provide more services and supports. Okay, so this is the thing. So the Andrew case, this is how much it cost the school district. $1.3 million. So schools don't like to go to due process. I mean, it took several years. Um, because if you prevail in the due process case, the school has to pay your fees, your attorney's fees. If you lose in a due process case, you don't have to pay their fees. Okay, that's called fee shifting. They don't have it. We don't have that in IDEA. You don't have to pay their fees unless the school district proves that you really had absolutely no basis, no good faith basis to bring your claim. Okay? Um, or you were, or they offered you everything and you said no. So there are certain circumstances, but they have to really show bad faith. Um, so school districts will always have to pay their attorney's fees whether they win or lose, and they will have to pay your fees if they lose. So it's an expensive proposition. Okay. Um, this is the, the LRE, the continuum of, continuum of services that Lori was talking about, A, B, C, D, E, and that really means how much time the child spends with typical peers. And these are actual percentages, so we're always bringing on little calculators with us. We're using the, the, um, the phone to figure out, because sometimes you don't know, hmm, is this really a, a B kid or is this an A kid? Okay, so sometimes it comes down to the actual minutes that the child is receiving on um, services. Any questions? Because we know what to do this. Um, so I know that you said the rules recently changed and if you request an IEP. What? The rules recently changed in Arizona that if you request an IEP meeting, um, they have 45 days to hold it. School days. 45 school days to hold it. But is there any kind of uh, timeline for how long they have to respond to your request? Or do they have the full 45 days they could just ignore you? No, you don't want them to. If they ignore you, you need to, you know, be nice and say, maybe you missed my email, but I really want this IEP meeting. You can always file a state complaint. That doesn't cost anything. You can do that on your own. You don't also need a, an attorney for due process, by the way. You don't need an attorney for anything. But, um, so a state complaint, if they're not responding to you, file a state complaint. Or you can file a civil rights complaint. That's something else. Um, the way around that, if I've, a parent really needs um, an IEP meeting and the school is not, is waiting, you can file a due process complaint yourself. Because if you file a due process complaint yourself, the law requires that the school have a resolution meeting within 15 calendar days. Calendar days, which comes out to about 10 school days. 11 school days. Um, you can do that yourself. So, but schools don't usually wait for 45 days. That, that was really for just some parents who are asking for IEPs. They walk out of an IEP meeting and then they ask for another one. So. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about charter schools. Anybody have their kids in charter school? 
Um, if I had a soapbox, I'd literally get up on it. Um, and I, I, I want to. I know I'm. On, I know I'm being recorded. And I'm going to preface everything I'm going to say with there are some really good charter schools out there. I haven't met them. No, I'm kidding. There are some really good charter <laughs> schools out there. Them. But the ones that I'm, I'm often dealing with, I go to due process. I'd say most of the cases I file due process on are charter schools. Um, they're semi-autonomous. They're independent, they are not private. Some of them think they're private or act like they're private, but they're not. They're getting public funds, and if they're getting funds, they have to comply with IDEA, and they don't always like to. And I always tell this one thing story, I have had at least three or four, at least three, I think four, parents that have come to me with almost the same story from different charter schools. It's, you know, mid-year or the end of the year, they come and they go, you know, um, such and such charter school wants to um, tell me that I should go back to the public school. So well, tell me about the conversation. And I could have told them what the conversation was. You know, we love Johnny. He is great. He is terrific. And, and he works really hard. He's just not meeting our standards. At, at our school, we have some higher standards than they do at the public district schools. So, um, but we love him and we'd be happy to have him stay. However, under our standards, he is gonna have to repeat this next school year. He's gonna have to be held back. Um, and, and that's fine, we'll keep working with him and that's great. But you know, if you do put him in the public district school, he will matriculate to the next grade. A lot of parents will just take their kid and move them. Sometimes though, they do come to us. That's not appropriate. They have to work with the IEP. They have to They have to be open to all children and they have to provide faith. And some of them do. But the ones that I, I seem to be able to go. Um, they're operating under a written contract with the state or the, the school district or some entity. And they have a contract, it's a charter, and there's a charter board. and but it has to be open to all children and they can't charge a fee, although I know a lot of them have fees for certain things. They're not really not supposed to. Um, so, uniforms? And yeah, uniforms and, and, you know, it's what happened to the fate, you know, free, appropriate public education. So, um, but students in charter schools are have the same rights that they have in the public schools, in the public district schools. Um, they have to comply with the federal laws and regs. Um, dear colleague letters. Dear colleague letters. I'm not as good at that. Um, there are issues of admission. Again, you know, to trial qualify, they have to be open to all students. Um, they, they shouldn't be asking if you have an IEP before they tell you that you're already in the school. Um, they can't exclude so your or application, discipline. your application cannot say, cannot say, does your child have an IEP? That's your application. Your enrollment, your admission papers will ask. Okay. So OCR has already come against charter schools that ask if you're on the app, on the application, if your child has. An IEP or five or four cannot do that. So, in conjunction with that, I'm assuming that applies to the public school district as well. If you are trying to open enroll and they tell you they have an open enrollment seat, and then they say, "Oh, but did, are you on an IEP?" Can they then tell you, "No, they don't have the seat"? It is different. Okay. And the reason it is with open enrollment, you have a right to go to public school. Uh -huh. You have a right to go to your home public school. Okay, so if you want to go to another school, uh -huh. they can't discriminate against your child with, with disability if they have a seat for them. But in order to know if they have a seat, they do need to know what, the what their needs are, what are the services. Because if they have, say they have one speech person on campus and your child needs speech, they don't. The resources aren't there. Right. What if it's your home school and they're still saying we don't have the resources? Oh, they can't do that if it's your home school. Okay. And, and I will also tell you, once your child is in a charter school and then they get ident identified or a need is found, they can't say we can't keep you here. You have to leave. They can't do that. Right. They have to 
find or make or get whatever services they have. The charter. Right, the charter does. Yeah. If you're open enrolled, I mean, they can't kick you out right then and there, but I think come the next enrollment, they can say, you know, you need, we, we can't, we can't do this anymore. Okay. So. And standards, we see that children are not, the, the schools say, even I've had, even had attorneys saying, but it's a rigorous curriculum at home, you know, it's rigorous. And I say that to my parents, I can have that conversation, the school really can't, you know, and sometimes why, especially taking a kid who's got ADHD and anxiety, you know, really think, what is best for your child, okay? Is this really the best environment? A lot of times parents like charter schools because they're small. Um, but it may not always be the best place. So, um, dear colleague letters, letters that are issued by the United States Department of Education from the Office of Special Education Programs, and they're really guidance to schools that ask questions on interpreting um, the, the statutes, the laws, and they're not, judges don't have to abide by them, but they're guidance on what schools need to do. And so dear, so the OSEP, OSP, has issued these Dear Colleague letters saying that better, that charter schools have to comply with all the um, federal regulations. So really interpreting, yes, you have to comply with that. You know many other letters, so you can. I think I have a bookmark at the end to show you what you can bookmark. But you can look up these letters by topic too. I think we covered that. Yeah. Well, so the 504. The way you get a, a 504, if your child doesn't qualify for an IEP, you'll usually get a 504 and you get a 504 plan. First, is an eligibility. Does your child have a disability? Does your child have a mental and physical impairment that substantially limits a major life activity? Okay, it could be such, and that could be ADHD, and a major life activity is, could be learning, could be concentrating. Um, then your child will qualify for uh, a 504. Schools don't get additional funding for that, um, and all the school has to do is provide accommodations. Like I said, um, just extra time. Your child has to still do the same standard. They have to prove mastery. Now, it could be that if there are 100 problems and everyone has to get 70% um, uh, you know, right, for a child with ADHD, maybe they only have to do 50 problems, but they still have to get 70% of the 50% right to show mastery. Um, and then, so with an IEP, you get accommodations, you get modifications. And the difference, I usually use this example, if your child has ADHD, they're in ninth grade, everyone's reading Romeo and Juliet in Shakespeare language, and they, have, they can get extra time to do the work. But if your child is ninth grade and is cognitively impaired and reading at third grade level and everyone's doing um, reading Romeo and Juliet, a good adaptation or a modification would be that your child is then given um, Romeo and Juliet in third grade uh, reading level, you know, in cartoon form. So they're accessing the curriculum, they're getting the same concept, but the standard has changed, okay? Um, that's specialized education. And schools get federal funding, and then again, like we said, they get accommodations and modifications. And there are lots of times where, you know, we'll debate with this, with the, um, I had a case where we wanted an IEP for a child, and the school district was so adamant, no, that child doesn't need an IEP. So they gave all these accommodations. I said, you know, these accommodations really sound like modifications. And the attorney, who, you know, we're basically friendly with while we went at it. It was like, no, they are not. They have accommodations, they are not modifications. I said, oh, yes, they are. Anyway, what we did was we found another disability for the child to qualify for an IEP. That was totally unrelated to the one we were looking for, because we were looking for ED, actually, emotional disability or autism, but we found a specific learning disability the child qualified for. That's how we got the IEP. That's how we resolved it. And once you're in the door of special education, doesn't matter what your label is, you get all the services that you need. That was just a case. I didn't, I didn't say everything I wanted to. What about that twice? Yeah, you know. Okay. All right. Rights in private schools. Okay. You, your child goes to a private school. Um, you know, you put them in a, a parochial school or a parochial, Notre Dame. 
you think your child has a disability or may have a disability, you can go to your local school district and request an evaluation on your child fund. Okay? Um, and then the local school district may have to consult with the private school and not necessarily provide services, but provide a, a plan that your child needs. Okay. Okay. Uh, in the process of identification, I'm going to run through these and I'll go through them specifically. Identification, evaluation, and IEEs, eligibility, which is you met meeting, IEP, implementation, and progress. That. Review at least annually, at least annually, and reevaluation every three years. So we'll start with the identification. Um, child find. Can we talk about that a little bit? Um, that they have a duty to to find students in their district, not necessarily the school, um, and determine or at least identify does this child maybe have. Uh, some learning disabilities or some disability that they would need special education and they have, they're supposed to identify them. One way that they can identify them, oh, yeah, um, these are certain things that they should be looking at. 45-day uh, screenings, everybody know what the 45-day screening is? This is a really good document, really good if, if you're looking for something. Um, I, I just had a case recently where a parent came to me and the child had um, a disability, had an IEP, he was in third grade, had an IEP for speech and motor, OT. And the kid was getting in trouble and there were problems at school. Long story short, they came in because the, the school was kicking them out. Well, anyway, it's too long a story for that. but. I asked for the records, and the first thing I looked at was a 45-day screening report, which was two, you know, from kindergarten, so it was more than two years old. And right on it, it said that the child had problems cognitively, behaviorally, in addition to the motor skills and the, the I mean, it was everything was marked off, and we'll go through a form in a little bit. Um, they never told the parents that, and so now three years later, parents finding out the child had some disabilities that they should have been evaluated for. So we were able to go back more than the two years to get them to, to do what they should have done, even though normally it's a two-year statute of limitations for due process. But because this is one of these exceptions to the two years, they didn't tell the parents. They didn't say your child has a disability. So 45-day screening is really, really important. Every child that enters into a school is supposed to be screened within 45 days and go over the screening report what they look at. Um, and then parents are supposed to be notified if there's an issue. And look at emails. So there are a lot of emails going back and forth to the family saying your child's getting in trouble or is having trouble. That's something that should be looked at and for identification purposes. How many disciplinary actions have they had? Um, are they getting bad grades? Uh, behaviors, internalizers, are they kids that, oh, no, they behave fine. Well, he's sitting in the corner by himself, never talking to anyone. That should be an identification. Um, if they, even if they have anxiety, if it's not necessarily related to school, but there's some issues, those are things that the school's supposed to bring to the parent's attention and ask if they can do an evaluation. Even if the child is going from grade to grade, they're, they're passing. But there's something, something going on. Um, so let me go back to that 45-day screening report because it is really, whoops, too far. They look at vision, they look at hearing. So this is for all students, not just special ed. Just to understand every student is supposed to have this screening within 45 days of entering into school. They don't have it if they already have night. Unless they already have night, okay, right. But if they, they're entering into a school, um, they are supposed to get this. And it should be in your child's file. Um, so vision, hearing, communication, cognitive or academic, adaptive development, social, behavioral, motor. Um, if the students transferred, you know, how did they how did they do compared to where they used to be? And if any of that is checked off, they're supposed to put that there is a problem noted and action taken. 
Um, or they can put no problem if there's no problem, and then that's the end of it, it goes into the file. But there should always be a 45 day screening report regardless. In the case that I was talking about, problem noted, action taken below, was checked off. And it said parents notified in 10 school days that concerns were, were noted, but my parents were not. And they couldn't prove, the school couldn't show me anything that said that they were. But then they also had, under other, that they would go into evaluate for the things he would, had already been known and identified for. So they were gonna reevaluate for speech and motor skills. Doesn't say anything about the cognitive or academics or anything. So that is a really critical piece of evidence for us. Um, <coughs> evaluation. Okay, who can request an evaluation? Parents can, school can, um, somebody in administration. Someone, they have the duty to look for an evaluation to see if your child might need an evaluation to come to you. That's absolutely, that's child fine. But if they don't and a parent wants an evaluation, they can ask the school for one. And how is it made? There's no magic words, but we always tell parents to put it in an email or in writing asking for it. And all you have to do is say, hey, I have some concerns. I'd like my child to be evaluated. That's really all. You don't have to know the name of the test. Sometimes they'll say, well, what do you want to evaluate it for? And if you can identify it in layman's terms, that's fine. And I think he's having trouble in reading or writing or <coughs> emotionally. Um, and then they are supposed to have a meeting and go over what's the existing data. What do they have? The grades, depending on what part of the school year it is, the child's progress, their report cards, discipline, their entire file. And then they say, you know what, yes, no, we need to have evaluations. And they have to get your consent. They have to get it in writing that they're going to evaluate. Um, and if they don't get your consent, they cannot do an evaluation. They can do an observation, but not an evaluation. Um, so the evaluation, again, is it requested by parent or, or the school? Um, how is the evaluation made again? Can I just do this? Is that two slides? Same thing? Huh. Okay. Um, okay, so what do they have to evaluate for? Well, you go in and, and you say, you know, I have some concerns uh, with reading. Well, they're supposed to evaluate any areas that they're concerned about. All areas suspected disability, including health, vision, hearing, social, emotional, um, general intelligence, academic communication, communi communication. So they can't just limit it to one area if they have suspected anything. Once they evaluate, if you decide you want an IEE, you can get it in any, in any area. So if they forget, or they just don't, let's say they don't do an OT, and there's an issue with OT, and you say, you know, my, my child has problems. Um, Sensory. Yeah, they, you know, can't, can't handle being in the classroom. We, we want an IEE. They can't then say, oh no, we didn't get to do an evaluation, so we'll do an evaluation now. They have to allow you, either they have to allow you or they have to file due process while you're not found. So they are to do their evaluations and then within 60 days of the day, 60 straight days of the day that you sign that consent, that's why if you have a meeting, don't let them say to you, we'll send you the consent in a, you know, a few days. Right then and there you say, I, I want to sign the consent right now you want the clock to start running. They have 60 days to do that evaluation and meet with you at a MET, another MET meeting, to go over the results. Um, and then if you don't agree with them, that's where we kind of talked about getting an IEE. Um, and again, they have the two choices, like I said. And then after the IEE, you have another MET meeting and you go over the results and hopefully there's a consensus on what, what the results are. If not, um, the district person in charge will make the final decision, send you a prior written notice, and then you can either file a state complaint or a due process complaint if you want, want to fight it. Um, if it's an eligibility um, category issue, not a great case, as long as they find your child eligible in some area and you 
going to get special ed. However, if they find that your child is not eligible for special ed, it might be something that you want to pursue. So, the, uh, the team needs to go over the eligibility. Um, and I told you it has to be within 60 days. There's supposed to be a meeting notice tell you, telling you. My suggestion, you know you're going to have a MET meeting. You don't know if the child's going to be found eligible or not. Say, I'd like to also have the IEP meeting time set for right after. You have everybody there. You might as well go right into the IEP. If the child's found eligible, if you're not, everybody gets to go home early. Um, otherwise, they have 30 days to then hold up the IEP. So they find your child eligible, and then you might have to wait another 30 days to have another meeting to have the IEP. So try to have, make sure you have that time in there. Um, the meeting notice for the MET meeting must tell you what that they're going to be talking about, eligibility. Um, if they can also have the IEP, it should say, and they can't predetermine that the child's going to be eligible, but they can say, they may, may go into an IEP meeting after to determine um, uh, services um, in minutes. And then the uh, parents are entitled to, what are you entitled to in advance? There's nothing in writing that says you're entitled to that report, that evaluation before a meeting, or even an IEP before a meeting. But I suggest that you always ask for it. Before you're going to go to an IEP or a MET meeting, say, I'd, I'd like to report two, three days in advance. Um, there's nothing that says you're entitled to it. And they can say, you know, we don't have to give that to you. And that's true, they don't have to. But your argument is that you want to meaningful, 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 wow, I can't Meaningfully. say that, participate. And the only way you can do that is if you have this information beforehand. Because those some of those MET reports are really thick. And you might want to ask somebody about some of the terms that are in there, or an IEP even. You want to be able to digest it. They usually have a draft because they've already met and discussed, which they're allowed to do as long as it's just a draft. But they have to they should provide it to you so you should can be able to digest it and do it. And if they refuse and you get to an IEP and they give you a stack of papers, you can say, you know what, I need to look this over. Can I go into another room and everybody's going to have to wait for you? That's reasonable. That's the only way you're going to be able to participate meaningfully. Um, so those are the eligibility categories. The, on the left is the federal ones, but we, so the state here uses the state ones. Um, so some of, and those are the um, the acronyms for that. So some of them do require um, a a professional. It's changed. It's it's changed actually. So, um, but since we're at an autism conference, you know that if you have a medical diagnosis of autism from a developmental peed, for instance, and you bring it to the school, does the school then have to give you an eligibility for autism? No. Um, and uh, on the other side, can the school find your child is eligible for the elgi eligible for an IEP under the category of autism if you don't have a medical diagnosis? Yes. Okay. So the school can administer some of these tests. One is called the ADOS, um, and there are a couple of others, and they'll look for some of the symptoms, for instance, of autism, they can find your child eligible. Now, if you have a medical diagnosis um, and you bring it to the school, the school can actually disagree with this, the developmental peed, which is, you know, just weird. I don't know how else to say it. But more likely it is that the school will say your child doesn't qualify for an IEP for autism, or your child may have autism and ADHD, and so we think that the ADHD is what's interfering with your child's ability to do better in school. And so we're going to have the primary category as ADHD. And we're not even going to mention autism or we'll have it secondary. The problem for a lot of parents in that instance is sometimes parents want to use the empowerment scholarship account. And you get more money with an autism eligibility. Okay, so that's why a lot of times parents want the autism eligibility primary, because it's the difference between 
or approximately $25,000 and $3,000, okay? Schools don't automatically give you the autism eligibility because they will get, they get audited. And if they give it out too much, you know, um, or let's just say if the, if the State Department finds that they're um, finding too many children are eligible for autism, then they can start going through the records, okay? So that's why they're not so likely that, you know, you'll wonder, well, they get more money for my kid if my kid has autism. And that's the problem is years ago, schools were giving that at that label too frequently. Label schmabel. So remember, the label doesn't drive the services. Um, and I know, I believe that having the autism eligibility um, or the autism category is important if a kid has ED versus autism or ADHD versus autism, I'd rather see the autism because I believe that general education teachers will perceive a child differently. If they see a child who's labeled emotional disability, then they perceive the child as having, um, uh, being able to control their behavior, having more of a conduct disorder that is volitional or willful as opposed to having the eligibility category of autism, then they see more of a disability and that perhaps the child can't control themselves. So I think there's a different perception. I also have found in my experience, both as a teacher and as a lawyer, that um, I do see more services automatically in an IEP for a child with autism. You're going to get speech and language, you're going to get OT, um, you, you'll get social, social emotional, and you should get that if the child has ADHD and has those needs, but not everyone on the IEP team will actually see all those needs, or the board on the IEP team will see those needs. So these are some common eligibility categories for autism. You'll see intellectual disability, oh, uh, other health impaired, which is your ADHD and emotional disability, yes? So, what happens when there is an autistic in a classroom um, and then it's showing a little behavior that is not shown at home and it's becoming aggressive and the kid has been pulled over for um, detention? Um, perception is of parents that this is part of the autistic side of him and the expectations are that he should manage those on his own from the teacher. So we have gone through our first quarter with this behavior and our parents ask him to be part of one day school to see if we can uh, come to see what is treating this behavior because this behavior is happening at home and the special education are saying no. So, first of all, what you see in school is different than what you see at home. She knows that person. So, sometimes you see the angel at school. Why? Because they're holding it all together and then at home they're, you know, breaking the walls down. Or they're aggressive in school and they're good at home. But a child who is having behavior problems needs Functional behavior assessment. What is causing those behaviors? Is it for attention? Okay. Um, is it avoidance? So there. What's triggering the behaviors? So almost every student who has autism probably needs an FBA. Okay, because there are going to be behaviors that are not um, appropriate or non-compliant. So you want to see what is causing it and then they should have a behavior intervention plan okay, to address it. And you'll have replacement behaviors. Um, so if this is happening for a quarter of the school already, first quarter, you, where's the FBA? So you have to write to the school and say, look, my, my child's been having all these behaviors in school. I understand that you should have proposed a, an FBA. You just say FBA. Because you have to figure out really what's what's causing it. Um, sometimes it's a matter of communication. There was, we had a kindergarten kid who was hitting everyone. Why? Because he hadn't really, he was verbal but not, hadn't mastered language. And that was his way of getting, that was his way of communicating. 
someone might say that's his way of getting attention. But it was a function of his inability to appropriately communicate. It wasn't meant as bullying or aggression. And did that answer your question? So no one mentions an FBA to you? Pardon me? No one ever mentions an FBA to you? No. So I, I know you said that you wanted to go observe, but ask for an oh, FBA, and they will do it or should do it. And then same thing, you can ask for an IEP if you don't agree with that, that functional behavior assessment. It's just like another evaluation. We'll have to sign consent. So it used to be when you request, and I think another slide shows it, when you request an evaluation, it used to be up until uh, last year in October 2017, school had 60 days to do the evaluation and have the net meeting. Now it is 60 days from when you sign consent. But uh, once you request the evaluation, the school has, I believe it's 15 days to give you the consent form. Okay. That they may call it a met one meeting and say you have to come in and go over it and, and, and they'll have you sign it, but they have to do it within 15 days. Oh. Um, so they, how do they obtain the consent? They either send it home or they have the meeting and you actually sign it. If the school does not obtain consent, they cannot do the evaluation. That is a huge violation. Um, if what should a school do upon receiving requests? They have the 60 days to do it. Um, and do they must the school conduct the eval? They don't have to conduct the eval, but they better tell you why they're not going to. And we have this fight with with that uh, an adversary of ours. I my my opinion is that if they don't do it, you should ask for an IEE. They blew their chance to do it, and you get to, to ask for it and get it done. Um, and notice requirements. They have to you know, let you know that they're going to have meetings or have them met, um, they, they're, and the notice should be you know, what the intention of the meeting is going to be about. The IP team, if someone can't make it to your IP team, they have to get your permit. If it's a member of the team that has to has to be there. Um, you can excuse them, but they need to get it in writing that you've excused them. Another thing I see happen or have heard happen is that some, a member will get up during the meeting and just leave because they, they think they're done. Now, you, maybe you, it's the PE teacher and you got their input and you don't need them there. That's fine. Yet, you should give it in writing. Um, if, however, it's someone that is important. They can't just leave, and if they want to and you want them there, you can adjourn the meeting and say, we're gonna have to come back when they get there. So, um, frequency, I don't know what you mean by 30 annually. I don't know what you meant there. She wrote that, that you don't either, huh? Okay, frequency, you have to have it every, at least once a year, but you could ask for it more often. Um, and a met, an evaluation, uh, our met has to be happening every three years. Right? Oh, maybe 30 days after the initial um, eligibility. Um, and on the IEP, they're supposed to go through the plot, which is the present levels. Um, so you start there. I've been to IPs where they all of a sudden they skip to the goals. I'm like, well, we have to go over the present levels. We have to know how the child is doing presently before we can decide what goal, whether they at the old goals and what whether they need new goals and what services and um, and you talk about placement and location again talk about you don't placement. talk about location. you don't talk about location you talk about placement and then um, when I'm there I always ask about location but you're not really entitled to know that until they decide to tell you um, the Doug C case uh, we talked about parents having to, to be present this was a, a case where um, the IEP team asked the parents to come to a meeting. The parents kept putting it off. Um, and so the, the, the school said, oh, we're gonna have it without you. And they went and they had it. And the parents sued. Um, and the court said, no, you, you didn't try hard enough. And they, there were a couple of attempts there, but they have to really, really try to make it work for you. Now you can appear telephonically, you can appear by Skype. Um, 
but they can't just have a meeting. If you can't make it, don't worry that they're going to have it without you um, on one or two times. You know, if it starts getting to be like you're avoiding it, then that's where they, they may have some rights. But I would say this. So we've been having issues now where schools are saying one IEP meeting and it's not the annual IEP. So I get a little paranoid. Um, sometimes it's to change placement. Sometimes it's to do exit criteria from a private school. Um, unless the child is really struggling, you may not want to have an IEP meeting if you think that they're want, wanting to change placement before the year is up. So you can always say, what is the purpose of this? You can have an IEP, you can re revise an IEP at any time by emails going back and forth. They send you a draft. So if you suspect that a school is trying to change placement and you don't want placement changed, such as a child being in a private school and they want the child out of the private school, try to put it off. Say, I'm not ready to have the annual IEP yet. Um, tell me what it is you want to discuss. And it has to be in the meeting notice that they want to discuss. They can start talking about placement if it wasn't in the meeting notice that they're going to talk about placement. So if you get to the meeting, and they try to spring that on you, pull out the meeting notice and say, that wasn't on here, we're not gonna talk about that now. We gotta kinda go quick, because we only have like six minutes. Oh, okay. Um, goals. You have to be smart goals, so you have to understand the goals. That's why you want the IEP in advance. You want them to see what's the baseline. Um, is it something you understand? And one of our opposing counsel actually says, when you have an IEP, it has to be understandable by the reader at Walmart. And what that means is you want someone who has never been involved in education, although a lot of times people retire and do that, but you want someone who's never been involved in education, never had an IEP, to understand it. We see IEPs coming from other states, and schools are supposed to implement them and provide comparable services. I can't understand that. But sometimes when I see an IEP written here and I don't understand it, that's a real problem. So you have to really understand, you have to understand what your child is being told and also take a highlighter and, and, and look at how the progress is going to be measured and ask for that data. Data, data is a fancy word, simple word, for something that says I want to be able to see it. Okay? I want to see five minutes. So I want to actually see the data. Show me the teacher me test. Show me whatever you're giving my child to measure that progress. Okay, go. So these are measurable or not measurable, that's a quiz. And so the ones I um, pressed out are not measurable. You know, we want Johnny to understand, we want Johnny to determine. Those are very vague words. Um, so now what the school has to implement, has to collect data, you want to see that data, okay? Um, how often does the IEP team meet? Well, we always have these once a year. And all these notices, meeting notices, what you get before a meeting. Procedural safeguards notices, what you get at the meeting. And prior written notices, what you get after the meeting, prior to any changes. Um, I used to tell parents to make copies of anything they sign before you leave. Take your phone now and just take a, um, a picture. And then just very quickly, a couple of things. You can take reports surreptitiously in the state of Arizona. I encourage you not to. I don't ever want to see my parents um, take things surreptitiously. If you have to go to hearing, it looks better if you say you're taking a lot of reason to take this because you don't remember things. You don't want to write notes. You want your, you know, the, the other parent to hear everything. You don't want to have to disagree about what, you, what was said. So you have that record of it. Um, and then sign the attendance sheet at the end. Why? Because so that you can take a picture of who signed it and so no names are added later. Okay, that has happened. You are signing for attendance purposes only. You're not signing because you consent. Some school districts will say, well, you signed it. If you feel more comfortable, say, I'm signing for attendance purposes only. Okay, if someone has left during the meeting, this way, you're signing at the end, and you can say the gym teacher left after 10 minutes. And you will actually write that down. Remember, we take the picture. Um, when you calculating days, I said calendar days, straight days, full days, business days. Okay, quickly try. Okay, so that's important. So these were the changes that were made in the rule here. So it used to be that, for instance, a hearing impairment, you have to have a neurological evaluation. Now it's 
qualified professional. So a qualified professional has to be involved with those eligibility categories. And it's defined using examples of violations. How many About 10. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay, the 504 plans, I mentioned that before. And these are major life activities. They're distinct example. They're not exclusive. It can be anything. And for a 504, you don't look at the ADHD medicine, for instance. You don't look at the mitigating measures, okay? And if a school ever says to you, you need to medicate a kid, you know, they're not a doctor. They're not making that decision. And I would never have that conversation with a parent. That is your decision. Do you have to tell them if you're medicating your child? Can they ask? And they can ask. Them, they're not supposed why to. Why or why not? They, they, they're not supposed to. They can ask, but say that's really not open to this guy. I don't want to talk about it. Um, unless they're giving, administering the medicine, but they can't tell you to do that. So, okay. um, but I know, yeah, when I when I hear that question, I'm like, yeah. so, um, I'm just going to be That's it. So you need to. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so thank you.